For nearly 25 years, Ontario's environmental commissioner has reported to the legislature on the state of our waterways, wildlife, air quality, and such. This year's report, titled Back to Basics, contains some causes for real concern, including an assessment of the amount of raw sewage flowing into our lakes and rivers. And notably, it's issued at a time when it's unclear what the future of the office will become in light of the government's plan to eliminate it as an independent watchdog. Diane Sachs is Ontario's Environmental Commissioner, and she joins us now for more. Good to have you back in that chair. Thank you very much. Can we just start by having you remind us what the mission of your office is? Sure. I am the guardian of the Environmental Bill of Rights. Anybody who wants to know what that is, go to our website, eco.on.ca. And I have been required by law to report to the legislature at least three times a year on energy, environment, and climate. And when you have filed reports in the past, you've had the job for three years now, do governments tend to pay attention to what you say and then try to fix what you say? Uh, they do pay attention. And depending on the government, sometimes they try to fix it. There are a lot of uh, traces of our work even in the new government's environment plan. But what we saw in the last three years was real progress on a number of not very sexy but important topics. And I guess it's fair to say that you don't really have any legal authority to force them to do anything other than the moral suasion of your office, is that right? Correct. I have a flashlight, a can opener, and a microphone, that's all. <laughs> Good, got it. Uh, let's do then, uh, let's peel back the cover on, uh, on your report for this year because the Back to Basics report does look at the state of our water. And Sheldon, if you would, the first graphic, please. Here are some of the things that have caught your attention, namely the cleanliness and safety of our water sources such as lakes, rivers, and groundwater, drinking water sources such as private wells and those in northern and indigenous reserve communities, pollution threats to municipal water sources that include raw municipal sewage, agricultural runoff, toxic industrial wastewater, and road salt. And an example of this would be raw sewage overflowing into southern Ontario waters more than 1,300 times from the 2017-18 reporting year. Okay, let's get into this. What is putting our water sources at risk? Uh, government has for many years had a tolerance, an amazing and objectionable tolerance to these large pollutants. And you mentioned sewage, agricultural runoff, industrial toxics, and salt. And between them, they have big, growing, long-lasting adverse effects on our lakes and rivers. For example? Well, for example, you mentioned the 1,327 overflows mm -hmm. of raw sewage. I mean, that's human feces, it's vomit, it's mucus, it's blood, it's uh, urine, it's dog poop and soap and oils and all of this stuff being allowed to flow into rivers and lakes. Which are the source of our drinking which water. Which are the source of it. Not, and not just our drinking water, it's uh, uh, you know anything else we might like to do with water, or swimming, fishing, everything that lives in the water and depends on the water. And we treat it as if it doesn't matter. We put filth in it all the time because it's cheaper to blow it in the water. How is it possible in 2018 we still have sewage flowing directly into water? Well, I think it's, it's amazing and, and should absolutely not be allowed. There's 44 municipalities in Ontario from Toronto to Moonbeam who still have combined sewer systems. Climate change is making the intensity of rainfall greater. We have more rain, especially in the winter now, than we ever did before. And that tends to overload the sewer systems and flush the filth that comes from our toilets directly into the lakes and rivers. The government is responsible for enforcing the Ontario Water Resources Act. Municipalities have a defense if they're doing everything they reasonably can to prevent it. And they're not, and the province isn't doing anything to enforce it. I presume, though, that it would cost multiple billions of dollars to retrofit our sewage systems so that when, it, when we did get heavy rainfall, what you've just described wouldn't happen. And I bet the treasurers at City Hall and at the provincial level are all saying, we don't have that money right now. That is the excuse they always use, and mm -hmm. that's based on the assumption that the only solution is to build hundreds of millions of dollars worth of concrete. But that's not the only solution, and we show a number of other things that can be done. Well, the first thing people should be doing is there should be stormwater funding so that finan uh, every property owner has a financial incentive to keep the water where it falls. That's been proven to work. Kitchener does it. Mississauga does it. Most Ontario municipalities with combined sewers still don't. And so they don't have enough money to run their sewage systems properly. Private property owners are allowed to dump all of the rain directly into the sewers where it floods into our lakes. 
uh, it's, it's unnecessary. There's a clear and straightforward solution. Every municipality can do it. Most of them don't. Do you have any reason to believe that the quality of our drinking water is being affected by this? So not for people like you and me who get our water from the municipalities. Um, most, about four-fifths of Ontarians get our water from municipalities. But the people who are on pr private wells or water intakes and the 3% in First Nations and Indigenous communities, they're pretty much on their own in terms of protecting their water sources. Agricultural runoff that pollutes our water has been uh, a problem for a very long time. Why do you think there's been no action on that one either? Well, it's very hard for me to answer why questions. You need to ask the government why they do okay. and do things. But what I can tell you is that there has been very little effective action. Uh, the pro provincial government hands out a lot of money, but they don't do any compliance uh, um, checking. They don't do any enforcement. They haven't been doing monitoring to see if all the money they're handing out is, is helping. And in addition, one of the big issues is that the province is allowing the continuing destruction of wetlands. And when we lose the wetlands, there's no place for the rain to go when it comes, and that tends to cause erosion, wash more soil into the rivers, and that soil carries more nutrients, which feeds more algae. Plus, Should, plus sorry, climate change is making the, the lakes and rivers warmer. When they're warmer, the algae grows more happily. Should farmers be doing more? Farmers should be doing more, but they shouldn't be having to pay for it all themselves. We've got a real unbalance of costs and benefits. So a farmer who protects a wetland on their property bears all the costs, and everybody around and downstream gets the benefits. We should have a fair balancing of the costs and benefits. You mentioned the wetlands a couple of times there, so let's go into that now. And Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up board two on that. Southern Ontario, you tell us, Commissioner, has lost nearly three quarters of its wetlands in two centuries. Southern Ontario watersheds, have less than 30% of the forest cover needed for functional ecosystems. Some watersheds have less than 10% and some as little as 3% of what is needed for the health of our biodiversity. This loss means we can't properly filter pollutants from water, reduce flooding, protect against soil erosion, and filter our air. How is it that we have lost so much of these natural protections over the years? And just for clarity, some of those stats were about wetlands and some were about woodlands. Okay. But um, the, the area of Ontario that is left most naked in the face of storms is southwestern Ontario. So if you look at Essex County, for example, the minimum level of wetlands for safe hydrological cycles is about 10%. Essex County is down about 1.5%. Next to them is St. Clair Conservation Authority. They're at 0.1%. So they've given up 99% of the wetlands they need to hold the water. And that's a direct result of bad government policy. What do we have to do to stop the further erosion of our wetlands? Well, basically, uh, the first thing is that the government doesn't give wetlands any kind of protection until they've been officially identified as significant. And they've got a 260-year backlog in getting around to that. Hmm. And even then, they never look at the little ones, which are very, very important and better at filtering out water, uh, water pollutants. We also see the government proposing just yesterday to blow yet more holes in the protections we do have for natural features, the Clean, the Clean Water Act, basically all the environmental protections. They're apparently going to blow holes in all of them now. That, you, I presume you're referring to a new bill that was new, just introduced yesterday. new bill just introduced yesterday. Okay. Which one's that? Six, 66. 66. Okay, which provides for what? Well, I haven't been able to read it in detail, but it looks as if it's going to allow any municipality to simply uh, allow developers to ignore all these provincial laws that are designed to protect the natural world. Can we... I remember with the ozone layer, you know, we banned... What was that thing? CFCs? Yes. And suddenly, well, you know, the world came together, Montreal Protocol. Right. Well, the ozone layer's back. Can we reverse the erosion that has already taken place? Well, it's, it's, the window is very small. We still have time, but right now Ontario is going in exactly the wrong direction on everything that's important. Hmm. The loss of woodland is threatening our natural wildlife. Do you have a, a ballpark figure as to how much of that wildlife has been affected so far? Oh, well, enormously. But uh, the, the first thing is wildlife needs a place to live. And the, as we continue to destroy the woodlands and the wetlands, there isn't any place left for them to live. We destroy them, degrade them, and so on, and, and break them up. Uh, but again, if you look at southwestern Ontario, just a dramatic loss of both woodlands and wetlands. So no place for the wildlife to live, no place to hold the water to protect from flooding, uh, no place to clean the water, no place to provide cooling as we get these increasingly hot temperatures that climate change is bringing. We've given up the protections that we need, and we continue to destroy them. In fact, the Ministry of Agriculture uses your and my tax money to actively subsidize wetland destruction. 
It will not have escaped your attention that last week the Minister of Environment, what's his new title? P Conservation and Parks, uh, brought out his new report for what his, he... His plan. His plan, okay. Uh, shall we hear from him? He was in that chair uh, earlier this week. Here's Rod Phillips. Sheldon, if you would. The other side of the coin, um, which is you know, commonly called adaptation, but, but I like to talk about as helping families and communities prepare for climate change and deal with climate change, really is about a much more um, uh, granular understanding of what climate change means. And so part of this is the assessment, the first ever assessment in Ontario of the actual impacts of climate change and uh, helping people understand that through various tools but also uh, frankly a fair bit of work that has to be done to drive it down to a community level um, and then dealing with some very practical matters uh, practical matters like flooded basements uh, like eroding shorelines things that people relate to and understand um, and want to make a difference in so well, that I we can en en enlist everybody in in this uh, and not have it be an abstract conversation happening in Poland or that Paris. That is, yeah, one of the things I've heard you discuss frequently actually is that where, whereas the previous Liberal government may have been talking up here about climate change, you're, you're very much, you're down to earth. You're more down to earth. We're doing our best, yes. Okay, he says doing his best and his report covers everything, plan, sorry, covers everything from climate change to picking up litter. You've had a chance to look at his plan, I presume. Any thoughts? Well, the plan has a number of good elements, many of them taken from our reports, to deal with small things. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to deal with small things, but it doesn't matter very much unless you get the big things right, and the plan gets the big things wrong. The two most important environmental challenges, which are going to overwhelm everything else, are climate pollution and the collapse of biodiversity. And the plan goes from weak to nothing on both targets and action on both of those. Well, he does say that he will hit, that the province of Ontario will hit the requirements of the Paris Agreement uh, by the date specified and that we are, I think his estimate was, 22% of the way there already, so we only got 8% to go to hit 30. Well, first of all, it's, it's absolutely not true to say that what Ontario is doing is going to meet the requirements of the Paris Agreement. Uh, what he, I think, means to say is that Canada gave an initial commitment of what we would do by 2030, which was based on Ontario doing what we were then committed to do, and that if Ontario only does its proportionate share and relies on the rest of the country to do much, 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 much more than we are now going to do, then, then, then he says, well, then Canada can meet its initial commitment without us. Anyway, that's too complicated for people. Bottom line is that Ontario is, uh, by Ontario dropping what it's going to do by 30 megatons, that's the amount of emissions of three whole provinces, um, it's going to make it very, very, very difficult for the rest, of, for Canada as a whole to meet its commitment. There isn't, the, there just isn't the capacity in other provinces to make up for what Ontario is now refusing to do. The previous government obviously had cap and trade as mm -hmm. part of its solution yes. to hitting those Paris agreements. The federal government has a carbon tax in place as part of its strategy for hitting our commitments. This government obviously doesn't like either one of those options. Is there something they ought to be doing? If you don't like cap and trade and you don't like carbon tax, what's the other thing you could be doing in order for us to hit our marks? Well, the economic uh, Nobel Prize this year went to the man who proved that putting a price on carbon is the cheapest and best way of dealing with carbon pollution. And in fact, of, uh, the provincial government does intend to impose a carbon tax on industry. They just call it something different, but it's still a carbon tax. Hmm. Um, but what we know is the things that work, pricing carbon and cap and trade was working really well in Ontario. Investing in solutions, we can't do that now because we've given up the money to invest in solutions for most things, and strong regulation. So the government is, they, in their plan, they've gotten a lot of things that they say are going to help, but most of them they're not doing anything to achieve. Like they say, we're going to have more electric vehicles, but they're not doing anything to achieve them. Uh, they are going to increase, they say, ethanol requirements, which is an extremely expensive way of reducing emissions. It has significant adverse consequences for other environmental things and has a very high energy cost. So that instead of choosing a less, a less costly thing that works really well, they're choosing a very expensive thing that doesn't work very well. Hmm. I want to ask you, Commissioner, about you. And to do that, I'm going to quote Martin Redcon, who writes for the Toronto Star. I'm sure you saw the column. Ontario's independent environmental commissioner, Diane Sachs, has decried the new climate proposal for being, quote, one-third as ambitious as the cap-and-trade program it is replacing. Sachs exhorted the previous Liberal government to do better, and she has encouraged the progressive Conservatives no less since they took power. But their response was to announce her position will be eliminated. 
The Tories not only axed the tax, they sacked sacks. Are you being fired? I don't know. They're eliminating your position, right? Well, sort of. Um, they have changed, they've eliminated the independence of my office. They have stripped away a number of our powers. They now expect the public to rely blindly on the government to itself to police the Environmental Bill of Rights, which has never worked before. Well, let's be specific about this. They say that they are taking the responsibilities that you currently have and are moving them into the Auditor General's Department and the Ministry of the Environment. Do you think either of those two institutions are capable of doing what you have been doing? Well, I don't think that the ministry will be effective in policing itself. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, the fox and the, and the hen house. Um, in terms of the Auditor General's office, so, so the, until two days ago, the bill said that all my staff were going to be moved into the Auditor General's office. They changed that Wednesday night to crush the union in my office and to, to make it uncertain who, if anybody, will get a job with the Auditor General's office. Uh, and in terms of myself, I don't know. It will, be up, uh, there, it will be up to the Auditor General to select what they're now going to call a Commission for Environment. And I don't know whether that's going to be me or not. So theoretically, there will be somebody who is responsible for heading up environmental investigations. And it could be you, right? Y it, could, it could be me. And, this, and what I don't know is the it, voice that we've been able to provide for Ontarians, the clear access we've been able to give to inf of information so that people don't have to rely blindly on the government, which frankly doesn't always tell the truth on environmental issues. We don't know how much of that is going to survive. Um, we have been reporting separately on the, each of these issues. Every year, those reports are major undertakings, and they've been tremendously useful to people who are, want to know the truth about what's going on in energy, environment, and climate. Uh, now we're to be limited to a report or part of a report a year on under the control of the Auditor General. So there are some ways in which our mandate is consistent with the mandate of the Auditor General and some ways in which it isn't. Her job is to measure government performance in terms of money. Yeah, value for money audits. Va well, money, right? Okay. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. Our job is essentially to look at and speak for the issues that cannot be and are not measured in terms primarily of money. And in fact, the natural world is precisely what gets sacrificed, degraded, and overlooked when all we do is measure things in terms of money. Do you think you got legislated out of existence because you're a pain in the neck to them? Yes. You do? Anybody tell you that? No. How did you find out? I didn't find out. It just seems like a reasonable inference. No, no. How did you find out in the first place your office was being done away with? Uh, the CBC called me. So you weren't told directly by anybody in government? Correct. They still won't tell me when the, the uh, gu guillotine is going to occur. Have you had a meeting with anybody in either the Premier's office or the Environment Ministry to talk about this? I have met with the Minister and he would not provide me any information. What? I asked him specifically, when is this going to happen to us? Um, I asked him to put into the legislation what he said in public, that we would have our independence guaranteed. That isn't what happened. And I still don't know when the magic date is. Was that a face-to-face -face yes. conversation? It was? Yes. How did the conversation end? I thanked him and I left. Huh. The Environmental Bill of Rights, which you have there on the desk, turns 25 next year. It's been around for a quarter century. What kind of a difference do you think it has made in the lives of Ontarians? It's made a big difference. It's made a big difference in bringing information to the public so that they know what the government is doing. It's made a big difference in bringing information to the government because very often civil servants, many, many excellent civil servants, but they don't know everything. And especially as budgets are cut and they spend more and more time at their desk and they don't get out into the environment, they don't know what the people in Red Lake and Pecanjicum and Listowel and Dresden see every day. So the government makes much better decisions when the people of the province have a chance to have their voice. Also, the work of our office has significantly improved government compliance with the EBR, and we know that we've made a considerable difference to bring attention to issues that have been overlooked, and very often the government is taking action as a result of our advice. Here's a very, very simple example. Municipalities spend billions of dollars on infrastructure. They have always been required to make those decisions on whatever is the cheapest to build. When you build only for the cheapest to build, you build things that have huge operating costs, huge energy costs, but are cheap to build in the first place. Through our work, 
that rule was changed so that now municipalities are going to be authorized and required to consider operating and energy costs when they decide what to build. Over time, that can make an enormous difference in what it costs us all to run government, as well as the environmental damage that we do. That's just one of many examples. What do you think is the philosophy that is underpinning the current government of Ontario's approach to the environment? That's sort of a version of why are they doing what they're doing, and I can't answer why questions. I can tell you what the impact is, and the impact is we are all going to be much poorer in terms of everything in the natural world that we care about, and climate change is already doing enormous damage to Ontarians. We had $1.2 billion in just insured losses from extreme weather events in Ontario just in the first nine months of this year. That cost people much more than cap and trade ever cost us, and we're now on track to see it get much worse. Ontario is warming much faster than the world average. Did you know Toronto's already warmed three times as much as the world average? No. Nope. We've got another two and a half to four degrees we're expecting in the next few decades, and the track we're now on is going to make things much worse. That will overwhelm everything. Okay, let's finish up on this. And you're not expecting this question, so this is going to be different. And you've been here a few times, and I've never asked you about this before. But I want to this time, okay? People of a certain age will remember who your dad was. Only people of a certain age. Your dad was Morton Shulman, who did on City TV The Shulman File. He was a New Democrat member of the Ontario Legislature. He was a coroner in Ontario. And, and more than any of those things, he was a guy who gave him hell. Right? He just did not take any crap from anybody any time. And he was a, he was a, well, he just stormed the barricades for doing the right thing uh, all the time. If he were alive today, what would he, what would his approach, what would his advice be to you on how to handle what's going on right now? He would remind me that it's almost exactly 50 years since the Conservatives fired him because he was making public, he ordered an inquest into a fireproof hospital that the Conservative government was very proud of, which caught fire and killed somebody. And they tried to prevent him from holding that inquest. So he, he revolted, he thought the public deserved to know, and so they fired him. So I think he'd be very proud of me. They fired him and he got his revenge because he ran for the legislature and won a seat after that and made their life even more hectic. Well, I think more to the point is mm. the rules were changed so that phosphorus were that built too. better so that no, <laughs> nobody else is burned to death in, in a hospital. That too. That too. Wouldn't you like to go to the hospital and not be burned to death? Yes. Okay. Seems well, like a good he plan. helped with that. Okay. Is that okay to ask about that? It is absolutely fine. Okay, great. I'm very proud of him. That's Diane Sachs, at least today, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, and we'll see what happens next week and thereafter. Thanks again for your visits to TVO. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.